thought I'd say this, but I think you probably have to split the two issues. Uh, the future for uh, cities, particularly Canadian cities, uh, I think is pretty good. Um, the, 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 the main driver of, uh, of urban growth uh, is immigration. Uh, and uh, Canadian cities get more immigration uh, on a uh, percentage basis really than almost any other city in the developed uh, city set of cities in the developed world so that the Absolutely. the top five uh, Canadian cities are among the fastest growing cities uh, in, in the United States and Canada uh, and Toronto uh, pretty darn big city is growing fastest of all uh, on both a percentage and an absolute basis uh, to the extent that um, uh, we've already passed Chicago. This is a, we're talking now a urban regional population uh, in population, and we are actually catching up incredibly on Los Angeles, uh, whom we will pass if things go on like this uh, in the early 40s. Uh, and at that point, it'll be just us in New York uh, left uh, one and two on the continent. Um, I mean, this is really quite extraordinary. Uh, I, I've, I've lived in, uh, in uh, Toronto almost exactly 50 years. Uh, and, uh, you know, it is one of the most fascinating questions about how did this, frankly, really rather provincial uh, second tier city uh, get to be such a success? And the largest driver was immigration. Um, I think there are some subsidiary drivers there, which we have a very good education system, a really great public education system. Uh, and since cities are all about smart people, we're producing more smart people than uh, per capita basis than most other cities are. Uh, it's all about universities. Uh, university of Toronto is a stellar university. Uh, it's, it's always in the top 20 universities in the world. Uh, and uh, so if cities are about brains, which to an increasing degree they are, then, uh, you know, we've got great brain factories here. Uh, should also should always talk about the, the, the community colleges, George Brown, Humber, Centennial. Seneca. These are incredible institutions, and, and interestingly, they're they're not that common um, in uh, in other cities. Uh, it's common to be so successful. So that's those are the, the basic bones of of Toronto's success. I think are, are set by those sort of fundamental drivers of the city. Uh, the the you know there are uh, you know to to switch I guess a reasonably quickly to the transit question. Um, <clears throat> this is where I do have some big, big problems. M most of the COVID direct impacts, uh, for example, on uh, people not wanting to go into high rise buildings, not wanting to work in dense office floors. Uh, most of these things are going to get fixed uh, slowly. Uh, we're we're going to see office densities significantly lower than they used to be. Uh, but it, it, the, the office buildings are there. They're, they're going to get filled. Um, they may get repriced, uh, but they'll get filled. You can see it happening in the housing industry where uh, condo prices are stalled or maybe and rents are beginning to drop. And that's just high rise buildings getting repriced. The, the challenges on, on uh, transit, I think, are, are, are much more bedrock. Uh, and this is why it makes me nervous. Uh, uh, you know, I, jump in whenever you want to, Brian, on this, but, but uh, the fundamental problem we've got is that in all the big cities in the world, uh, the, the rate of car usage is, is essentially back up where it was. Uh, the rate of uh, bus usage is in about a 40-50% of where it was. Uh, subway uh, and, uh, and heavy rail transit were down uh, at about 25 to 30 percent, depending on which city you're in. Um, so that is not. Re people have are just not comfortable with riding in the subway, or riding packed together. Uh, and the question is, how long does that reluctance last? And my gut unhappily tells me that it's going to last longer than COVID. Uh, that there's going to be a COVID shadow. Uh, that extends with quite a long tail. Uh, and part of the evidence for that is that uh, transit ridership rates were, were essentially flat uh, going into uh, 
uh, into COVID. They were flat in New York, they're flat in London, they're flat in Toronto, uh, even slightly declining. Um, what that meant was that potentially people had got fed up with transit. They didn't like it. They didn't like the ride. Uh, they didn't like the experience. Uh, they prefer to uh, relocate their job or their, or, 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 or their transit mode to car, uh, a little bit to biking and walking. Uh, but uh, as, a, as a commuting choice, I, I, I worry that potentially we've perhaps passed a, a, a rather critical uh, preference line uh, with respect to people's uh, happiness about being jammed together in a tunnel with a hell of a lot of other people. In your article, Joe, you, uh, you mentioned a couple of things in regards to pricing that you thought uh, um, transit agencies should be thinking about to get people to use uh, transit at other times. And then you also commented that people should be giving out Starbucks and Timmy's. Were you serious? <laughs> yeah, I think here's the problem. There are two dominant thought packages about transit. The first one is the engineering one, the, which the planning profession is a part of, which is build more lines. Here is where we should build them. Here's where the station should be. Very, very physical in its, uh, in its um, uh, conception. Um, what isn't there particularly is the consumer view of it. So essentially the public strategy is try and keep transit prices as low as you possibly can because low price will induce more usage. Well, I'm not so sure anymore. Uh, there are lots of cases where low price doesn't in induce more usage. Uh, I, I, I foolishly talked about coffee drinking, but that's clearly a situation where people are paying more on a pretty regular basis for something that they feel has more quality uh, associated with it. Um, and so it, the, the real question is, what is the purpose of transit? Um, and if the purpose is to get people downtown, well, look out, because only two thirds of the people uh, who were, were working downtown are likely to be working there uh, on, a, on a regular basis. So the whole pattern of transit usage is likely to change. Um, and I think we have to treat transit much more as an optional consumer uh, purchase that people will either do or not do. There are a heck of a lot of people who don't have any choices, but there are actually a heck of a lot of people who do have choices. Uh, and they uh, are showing us right now and, and before COVID how they want to deploy those choices. So I would, I would sack all the urban planners and I would sack all the engineers and I would bring in marketing people. Uh, people spend a heck of a lot of money marketing a very expensive cars, ridiculous cars that are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, and they do that out of some weird kind of, uh, of, of uh, triggering various nervousnesses about car buyers, about security and safety and stuff like that. So that's why SUVs are getting bigger and bigger. Uh, nobody's ever marketed transit. It's sort of like uh, brushing your teeth. Um, you you got to do it whether you like it or not. Uh, I, I think we might be at the end of the line uh, of that. And, and I'm, I'm alarmed because I'm a transit fan and I'm an urban density fan. But I, I, I think it might, uh, it, unless we completely rethink the service that we're giving, uh, we might not have the customers that we need. And the economics of transit are so marginal that uh, a 10% reduction in transit usage would kill almost every system in the world. How do you think transit uh, will change? And it's not just marketing, it's gotta be changing the product. Uh, to put it in perspective, we actually had a uh, speaker to one of our dinners maybe two years ago, who's now a consultant to Metrolink say that we don't actually have passenger rail service with Metrolink, we have freight. Because what we do is we shove a whole bunch of people on a train in Oakville and we uh, ship them down to Union Station where they get off. And we don't actually provide the kind of service, I guess, that you're speaking of. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I think you're right. I, 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 I don't have any magic answers here, but uh, you know, one of the things that clearly uh, you can see examples from other transit agencies 
you will see, uh, I, I'm a big fan of London transport and the regional rail system around them. And they have express trains and they have local trains and the express trains uh, charge more because it gets you there faster, but you still have choice. Uh, you can you can you can take a local train. Um, they they have uh, in in some of the of the of the, the uh, lines not by no means all of them. They have uh, different classes of fare, so you have a first class and you have a second class. When I was growing up, there used to be a third class. Amazingly, uh, and uh, in the first class, you get a cup of coffee, uh, and it's packed. It's, it's very interesting, especially on longer journeys. Nobody has ever dared to find out in the Toronto transit system or the Toronto region transit system what people are prepared to pay for premium fares. And what we all know about premium fares in airlines or in railways uh, is that that's where the operator makes their money. So they actually subsidize the back of the bus. Now, there are all kinds of you know, back of the bus, to use that phrase, and you can see all the trouble that comes up from it. But I, I think we are... We could be suckering ourselves into uh, a, a one-size-fits-all that, it, given that it's going to be under such operating financial stress, uh, uh, is going to get worse and worse and worse. Um, so, uh, I, 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 you know, I, I'm not. Sh I don't know, and I, I can see an interesting comment here about about uh, the the premium charge for for UP Express. I think that's fair ball. People won't pay a, a premium. Uh, you can see that on the London uh, Heathrow Express, 15 minute journey. The the first class in that is empty because people won't pay it for a 15 minute journey. They will for an hour journey. I promise you. So the Hamilton ride, the Oshawa ride. Uh, you, you'd be amazed by uh, who you would divert uh, from the car. And that, just to jump back without uh, overrunning myself here, but I guess if I have a fundamental desire, it is to rid ourselves of the dominance of gasoline-powered vehicles. Uh, and that is actually, I think, even more than getting everybody packed uh, into downtown, uh, it's going to be the decarbonization that is the really critical thing to do. Uh, and there are a whole bunch of ways we do it, a lot of which have to do with, with not selling gasoline-powered cars anymore, as they're not doing in Europe uh, as of 2030. Uh, but a, a, another one of them is to get people out because they can ride in, in a really uh, interesting, uh, pleasant subway uh, or, or train experience. We can come back to transit in a minute, but one of the other fascinating parts of your article was you talked about how office buildings have to change. And you uh, referenced that uh, to actually uh, get everyone in via the elevators in some high rise office buildings, it would take until after lunchtime. That's um, right. How do you think <laughs> office buildings in downtown Toronto are going to change? I think we're actually, this is something we can be pretty certain about because it's already beginning to happen very, very slowly. Uh, and, and also it's happened in Europe. It may be shutting down now, but certainly for the past couple of months, uh, several European cities have been back at uh, office occupancy. Um, and what you discover is that it's going to be very tough to get over about two thirds uh, of the previous uh, office occupancy. Um, and uh, I, because uh, why? You've got to have uh, spatial separation uh, in the office floor. Uh, and secondly, you've got the elevator problem which is not trivial, uh, getting everybody up and down. There's a lot of technology being and, and, and creativity being piled into elevatoring. Uh, and that's actually, I think, a, a set of systems which are going to go through a huge change over the next little while. They're going to have basically maglev type elevators, sideways running elevators, all kinds of stuff. Um, but the, the interesting thing is if we're down at two thirds, the, the occupancy of the actual floor plate of an office building, that's the population will be roughly what it was 15 years ago. There used to be about 225 square foot per office worker in the high rise towers. Now there's about 100 square foot per person. So in other words, in the last 15 years, the square foot per person has dropped because we're all working open plan. There are no more offices. We've got hot desks and all that kind of stuff. So uh, I think those kind of trends, which have been pretty uh, severe in cutting office space consumption 
uh, are now going to be reversed for a bit. We're going to we're going to go back to the uh, to the last century. Uh, but that, uh, the, the upshot of that, sorry, is that I think it's going to be very tough for office buildings to have uh, at any one time a, 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 a population uh, that's anything uh, th that's more than about two thirds of the population they had uh, before COVID. Do you think that's going to make uh, downtown office building building construction uh, less attractive? Uh, will rents go down? Um, will uh, yeah. Oxford and uh, Cadillac Fairview stock prices go down? Will downtown <laughs> well, be less I, dynamic? I, uh, I think there's been a bit of that already, but uh, I suspect not because I think it's going to happen to uh, the, the stock of high rise office buildings. Is, it, the same thing is going to happen everywhere in every city. So there won't be much uh, uh, city comparison. I think there's going to be some uh, uh, loss of primacy of the downtown to satellite centers uh, and, and, and potentially even just a, an absolute uh, a drop in the amount of, um, uh, of office space consumed because we all know we can work from home. Here we are. Uh, is it, and, and what we will see for everybody is I think a blended work style where we work two or three days a week in the office and two or three days a week uh, at home. Um, so that's going to result in, a, in, in smaller uh, office space consumption. But uh, the buildings are there. It's just like the high rise apartments are there. They're, they're not going anywhere. Uh, so they will get repriced, I suspect. I think that probably the pace, Toronto has been putting office on office space about a million square foot a year. This is more than New York, more than Chicago, more than loads of places. So that might ease a little bit for a while. So a decade ago, when you were doing work with the Mississauga Summit, you were talking about uh, trying to um, increase density and in nodes around Toronto rather than having the whole focus be downtown Toronto. Is this yeah. therefore just actually good because it's going to be an acceleration of a trend that you yes. saw a and, decade ago? And, and actually, what's interesting is that uh, you know the the uh, various uh, reports have suggested that that trend uh, of office uh, worker concentration from the central city out to satellite and suburban centers uh, was already happening pre-COVID. So again, the best guide for what's gonna be happening post-COVID is what was happening pre-COVID. Uh, the, the, Toronto was just getting so big and so dense and so congested. Well, there's gonna be an effect, which is that people are gonna move out. Uh, and, and again, I'm, I'm always drawn, if you wanna know what's gonna happen in Toronto next year, look at what happened in New York and London uh, over the last 10 years. Uh, and all of the cities around um, New York City, uh, like Newark and White Plains and Bridgeport, uh, etc., uh, these used to be just disaster places, uh, empty of population uh, 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 and, and, and declining. They are putting on office population quite aggressively right now. Um, same thing is happening in the, in the ring of centers around London. Uh, so there'll be a kind of triage, I think, that happens. There'll have to be people who want to be downtown, uh, and then there will be uh, 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 some people who can work successfully from satellite suburban offices, and then there will be a lot of us who will be working all or part of our time from home. You and your article talked about uh, working from Prince Edward County. I understand <laughs> that uh, you know Collingwood and uh, remote places around uh, Toronto um, are on fire from a real estate standpoint. Yep. Suburban areas around Toronto are in high demand. Could it go even farther than you're suggesting and go to sort of what uh, um, you know, Tom Friedman talked about uh, two decades ago, the world is flat and you can do work from anywhere? Yeah, well, I think, I mean, it's interesting. The world was supposed to be flat two decades ago. Uh, and in the last two decades, uh, it's become incredibly spiky to use Richard Florida's term. Uh, you know, few or few cities, the, the world's top dozen cities have been on fire for the last two decades. Uh, and Toronto is lucky enough to be one of those. Uh, that fire is going to dampen a bit. Uh, I'm not persuaded that uh, Winnipeg or Moncton uh, uh, are, are, are going to be the beneficiaries uh, of the decline of the central city. Uh, the beneficiaries, I think, are going to be a ring, and it's going to be quite a big ring uh, around Toronto. Uh, Kingston will be in it. Peterborough will be in it. 
uh, Barry Aurelia are obviously in it. Uh, 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 we know about Kitchener Waterloo, uh, but what about Paris, Ontario? You know, all of these folks are going to be, uh, you know, essentially part of uh, that bigger macro city that's, that, that's got a, a kind of visible and invisible wiring. You have another interesting uh, point uh, I found in your article, and that is that you thought too much of the focus from a city planning and uh, infrastructure and transit standpoint had been on downtown Toronto. And you thought that all the development in the future should be north of the 401, I think is the words that you described right. it. And you talked about how COVID-19 had, uh, had unfairly uh, negatively impacted uh, the lower socioeconomic parts of uh, Toronto. Can you yeah. talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, it, it, when you look at the map and the, you know, the maps in the globe today, uh, the, the map hasn't changed for the last six months. Where are the places that are most negatively affected? Essentially, they're in the northwest of the city and in the city region, that includes Brampton, uh, and they're in the northeast of, of the city and areas adjacent to that. Um, uh, and why is that? It's essentially because that's where people who can't work from home, who had to work uh, go to work on crowded buses, uh, uh, densely packed buses, because they had no other way to go there. Often people had multiple jobs. Um, you know, I had an experience uh, recently of uh, a loved one in the, 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 the care system. And uh, where did all those care workers came from? Uh, I remember because I had all the, the, the social insurance numbers in my, in my, my BlackBerry, uh, and they all came from up north uh, in the northwest. And they were going to my place and then they were going to three or four other places. And uh, where do all the retail workers live? Where do all the construction workers live? Where do all the truckers live? Where do all the people who work in logistics live? You know, these are the folks who actually kept our city going uh, over the last six months. Uh, and they don't live in, uh, in the annex uh, and they don't live in, in uh, Midtown Toronto or they don't live in, in, in um, Liberty Village. Uh, and so they, you know, they have uh, been hard done by, uh, to be perfectly honest. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's really uh, important that uh, we, I think, reverse slightly this enormous emphasis that we've had on the downtown and the waterfront uh, with a lot of, of blue ribbon uh, projects that, I, you know, I've been a huge fan of and I've been supporting, uh, absolutely. But... Uh, you know, they've been going now for 10, 20 years. They ought to be self-supporting. Uh, they ought to be generating their own uh, internal investment systems. Uh, and, and where do we need to, to, to spend money? You know, the, the biggest thing is Toronto Community Housing, 115,000 units uh, and a $2.6 billion uh, maintenance deficit. Uh, that's where the, the, the people who have suffered most in COVID live. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I did it slightly rhetorically, the idea that we just, you know, from now on, the city should only invest north of 401. But if you look at their investment patterns, it, they have for the last XDX decades been south of 401. Should transit change north of 401? Do you, do you uh, think that the LRTs that are planned and things yeah, like that? Well, I, uh, I mean, obviously, we've got Finch being built. Uh, we've, got, we've got other things in the works. Um, I, I think we have to have a very different view of transit and and i would love for toronto to 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 be a world leader in this uh, a, a view of transit in suburban communities uh you know very little works uh, from a transit point of view in those communities because you don't have the density uh and the 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 bus uh is a you know the standard ttc bus is just too big and too expensive and too inflexible uh, I would love us to go to a much more imaginative system there where we, we almost create a transit franchise uh, managed appropriately by uh, the public sector uh, that uh, invites uh, private delivery. Um, so there's a little bit of, uh, I'm sure you're all familiar, a lot of the uh, folks here today are uh, familiar with the Innisfil experiment with Uber. Uh, the pros and cons of that by all accounts, but uh, at least they're experimenting. Uh, the notion that you have to have a, a bus with a very expensive driver uh, that goes on a very inflexible schedule uh, it, it, uh, and frankly picks up very, very few people uh, in a lot of the circumstances other than on the, uh, on the arterials. Um, uh, I think we should be really throwing it out 
there and see what we could do. Uh, uh, there's some combination of uh, an autonomous vehicle, on-demand transit delivery, uh, a, 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 a bus vehicle that is in the 10 to 20 uh, passenger range, uh, hopefully without a driver, because uh, the driver is always the most expensive part of, of, tra of uh, bus transit delivery, uh, that can then act as a feeder to the more arterial systems of, of, uh, of LRT and, and subway. Um, but I worry that if we just go on the way we're going, uh, with a potentially uh, macro drop in ridership, uh, we are going to bankrupt the system that we have. What should government be doing? Do we need uh, federal government, provincial governments putting substantially additional resources into the TTC and go? Uh, well, I, I think in a, certainly in the short run, they're going to have to backstop them. There's no question. Uh, the amounts of money that are likely to be lost uh, in transit operations are of such significance that um, no government has that. Certainly the city government doesn't have the money to do it. Um, you know, I might be talking pie in the sky, but I, I, I would like us to start to really uh, innovate, as I said, from a consumer perspective on, uh, and from an operational perspective uh, on how we deliver transit, particularly in, in suburban areas. Um, the, the, there, we, we really haven't moved away from the single delivery system, the single operator uh, of transit, uh, the single fare. Uh, it's, 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 we're, we're operating, uh, frankly, a, a 50s or 60s system in a world in which uh, everything else around us uh, 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 in terms of, of, of goods consumption has changed dramatically. Uh, why haven't we uh, looked at, at that for transit? I was just in, in one happy uh, year ago, I was in Paris uh, and I was driving, uh, uh, riding on the, the, um, the one of the principal uh, subway line, the tracks uh, in Paris, the, the number one line that runs along the Seine east-west uh, through the whole city, long line. No driver. No driver on the most, on the busiest Young Street line uh, in, uh, in Paris. When you go to London, you discover that uh, certainly pre-COVID, had some problems post-COVID, uh, almost uh, uh, each individual uh, subway line is operated by a different operator under the control of uh, London Transport, Transport for London. Uh, these are ideas, uh, and certainly the flexible fare system is, is all over the place uh, in, in, uh, in London and Paris and other European cities. All of these ideas are completely foreign to the uh, the, the Toronto transit operating system, which is essentially one fare, one operator, uh, 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 and, and one operator who can't even properly connect uh, the regional transit systems together. Why? Well, I I I, I think that you know that it's very easy to criticize, uh, frankly, because we haven't had to. Uh, we've always had enough money um, to run it the way we've run it. Uh, and because uh, it, it, Toronto is the most, uh, the, 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 the Toronto city region is the most localized city region of any big city. We don't have, as in Paris, a government called Grand Paris. Uh, everybody thinks of Paris as being the, 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 the central area. That's only 2 million people. Grand Paris is 12 million people. And that includes all the suburbs around. Uh, and there is one transit authority for that. And that operates in a very, very flexible, imaginative way. Uh, London Transport, the same thing. Uh, so there actually is a government at the regional city scale in Paris and in London, and to some extent in New York City. We don't have a regional government. Uh, and uh, you know whether we will ever get one is a, is a big political question, but uh, we pay the price for that. So we had two professors from uh, Monk School of Government and the Rotman School of Government come speak to us uh, back, I guess it was uh, more than a year ago, and they were saying that was the problem. And they uh, determined, number one, that, uh, that uh, Metrolink slash uh, TTC should be combined into one regional uh, transit entity probably uh, take over all of the, the peripheral regional uh, transit organizations uh, uh, in York and Peel, et cetera. 
and that that should probably report to some sort of regional government. Is governance the issue? Yeah, no, no, I, I mean, I, I, I would subscribe to that. Uh, and then I would also uh, take some uh, uh, lessons in the operating style of uh, other uh, city regional transit agencies. Um, what, the, what the transit agency should be doing is guaranteeing quality of service, uh, guaranteeing safety, uh, guaranteeing consistency of, uh, of the offer to, uh, to the rider. I mean, what's fascinating to me is that uh, you see uh, on a, uh, everybody in, in the uh, Paris and London uh, transport systems wears the same uniform, uh, which is an immediate message. Uh, so there isn't someone wearing a GO uniform and someone wearing a TTC uniform and someone wearing a Mississauga Transit uniform. They're all wearing the same uniform. And it's incredible what, the, what the, 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 the messaging of that is. And also they have a Presto card uh, in each of those cities that actually works uh, and saves you money uh, as a, on a unitary system. Um, but then they're very imaginative. Once they've guaranteed that the, the, the consumer, the traveler, the commuter is king, after that, they, they, how they deliver that service is very, very imaginative. Uh, and and uh, for the largest part, most of the, those services in Paris and London and most European cities are, are, are delivered by private sector operators under very strong control. Uh, does that work, the private sector? Well, uh, it, it, it works in the sense that pre-COVID, pre, pre uh, London Transport made money. Uh, you know, so they made enough money. They, they had actually just taken away all of the operating grants uh, to London Transport just before COVID. Mm -hmm. Rushed to return them now, obviously. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very interesting. The, the, the way we do it here is... is uh, is probably the last holdout of uh, an entirely uh, public sector managed and operated system uh, in the world. But it sounds to me like you're suggesting that we need to go a lot farther in having uh, smaller cars, uh, uh, pri uh, different classes, uh, yeah. lots more amenities, um, different things I, that give people the confidence that uh, they're physically distant from other people. That's right. I, I mean, I don't know what, what the package is, and I just was throwing some ideas out in the article, but uh, uh, I don't think we can repeat what we're doing right now. Uh, you know, we're going to wake up with the most horrendous financial headache uh, in all our cities and, and transit agencies uh, next year. Um, and there's, you know, the question is, should we just try and put everything back together again the way it was pre-COVID? One is I don't think you're going to be able to because I think uh, uh, the, the, the consumer demand for transit will have changed so radically. Uh, but also, uh, I don't think we should anyhow. We should use, you know, uh, uh, never, uh, never fail to make use of a crisis. Do you really think so? With a vaccine and rapid testing? You don't think we'll just go back to normal in no, I think, six to I nine think months? Something to, to, I suspect that uh, transit usage has gone the way of uh, uh, e-shopping. Uh, e-shopping was increasing steadily, slightly, not very fast over the past decade. Uh, now it's just gone through the roof. So transit ridership was flat, slightly declining, and now it's just dropped precipitously. I think you'd have to be a very courageous person to think that we're gonna get back up onto the same curve we were before. And even that, as I say, was not was not uh, particularly um, uh, encouraging, given that things were static. So the people you're speaking to are members of Transit Alliance. Uh, most of us are in the transit business, um, either working for companies uh, or associations that uh, want transit and or bid on transit contracts or part of uh, 3P partnerships. Uh, given your fairly negative uh, outlook for transit as it is, what's your recommendation to them? I, I think we all, I mean, I, I have no, I, I'm the same way, you know, our, our firm uh, bids on a lot of transit projects uh, and, and, uh, and uh, I, I am a huge believer in, in finding ways in which we can all move easily and comfortably and environmentally safely uh, around our cities. Uh, but I think we'd be nuts not to recognize that something fundamental has happened. Uh, and uh, 
uh, the response to it cannot be just going back to what we were doing before. And right now, do you think that the TTC and Go Transit are effectively just going back to what we did before? I, I, I think they are doing a fantastic job under unbelievably difficult circumstances, and I have nothing but uh, admiration for the people who work there, and and you know for the, for the line staff who have to cope with um, uh, with, with with situations that you know frankly are probably putting them at risk in uh, in, in some way, uh, and so I. I, I you know, I, I think um, they are dealing right now with a crisis, uh, and they're dealing with it as, as best they can. Um, and uh, what everybody needs to do, and I suspect it has to be done probably uh, in, in the in the chill of the new year, is take a deep breath and say, "Are are we going back to exactly where we were before? Can we go back to exactly where we were before?" And you obviously think not. Uh, let me ask you one last question before I open it up. Sure. Um, in your article, you also, uh, talking about uh, will we go back to the way it was before, comment that um, you think Main Street retail will do very well because of the desire to go directly into um, the stores or the restaurants. And you, I think, uh, worry about regional mall uh, type retail. And then you also, um, and I've got a self-interest in this, uh, comment negatively about major events like sporting events and concerts and uh, things like that. What do you think is going to happen to regional malls versus Main Street and what's going to happen to major events? Uh, I'll start with the major events. Uh, you know, when do we all go to a sporting event again? Uh, and, you know, probably isn't going to be until sometime in the spring. But at that point, I think that will gather steam and we'll be back to normal on that. I mean, I, 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 uh, and partly I, without being sort of overly uh, crass, it's because there are a hell of a lot of businesses whose lives depend upon us going to sporting events and concerts, just like there are a hell of a lot of businesses depend on us getting onto, a, onto an airplane. Uh, so I think that that will steadily come back. Uh, the, the shopping thing, uh, I mean, it's fascinating. I was just listening to a program last night, which said that uh, uh, people used to, cons or on, on average, people pre-COVID spent about 40% of their food budget on eating outside uh, of their home. Um, that has dropped down to 8%. Um, so... <laughs> I mean, I mean, we all know that because nobody's going to restaurants very much and, and, and even the takeout, et cetera, is not being consumed as much as it was. Uh, uh, so I think we will see uh, main streets probably coming back to life. The, 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 the fact is that restaurants are a pretty key uh, driver of main streets. They don't, main streets don't sell anything uh, useful uh, anymore, they sell experience and pleasant shopping uh, and, and interesting things to to do and see. Um, but I suspect they'll come back. And also, the other thing: this is where Toronto, as an immigrant city, fifty percent of the people here are not born in Canada. Uh, the immigrant way of treating main streets is so energetic and so uh, lively that I think that will, uh, frankly, uh, keep most of them supported. The the the, the, the interesting comparison is what happened to St. Clair. Uh, with the putting in the St. Clair LRT, took seven years to do it, basically killed uh, the street from a retail point of view. Uh, now, two or three years after uh, the LRT is in, it is thriving. So there was a, a, an awful kind of uh, triage that happened there, but it came back very strong. And I think that main streets are probably going to be okay for the most part. Uh, small, but, but the, the shift to e-shopping has been so significant that clearly there's going to be a much lower level of um, uh, of, of floor space because that demand is gone. Uh, and I think uh, we're likely to see smaller malls uh, disappear, which they were doing already, uh, you know, Cloverdale Mall and, and other Humberview Mall, et cetera. They, they were going out of, out of business already. Uh, the solid malls are going to be strong. But even they have a problem with where's Neiman Marcus, where's uh, 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 Nordstrom's, where's uh, Indigo, all of these guys have gone. Uh, so they're going to have to do a lot of repurposing of a lot of their spaces. So. 
Uh, before I turn uh, to everyone else to ask for questions, maybe I could just say a few words uh, about Transit Alliance. Um, Transit Alliance, as I mentioned, is a civic advocacy organization. We've been going for about uh, eight years now. Uh, I've been uh, honored to be on the board for uh, about six of them and uh, chair of the board for the last four or five uh, years. Uh, we've got uh, a board of directors and we've got members over 100, at least last year we had members over 100. Uh, and we've been challenged by COVID-19 uh, because uh, as lots of different organizations like ours, uh, we have been uh, reliant on people like yourselves, all taking out memberships and then coming to our events. And uh, without uh, in-person events, uh, it's been challenging to, uh, to attract people to come and pay. Uh, we have had uh, three virtual meetings now uh, and we haven't been charging for the virtual meetings, uh, but we still do have some expenses associated with our administrative staff and some of the website maintenance and things like that. So I encourage you, number one, uh, if uh, you have been a member uh, uh, to consider uh, rejoining up as a member. Uh, and if you haven't been a member to consider joining as a member, and we hope that we'll have uh, in-person events uh, sometime in the future. Um, all of our virtual events we have recorded and you can get them either on transitalliance.com um, and as I mentioned we've had Ken Greenberg, Jennifer Kiesmatt, Phil Verster, um, uh, people from uh, KPMG uh, in the uh, in the transit business uh, including our, our board member Colin Earp that have uh, presented uh, and uh, the chief economist at uh, at KPMG which was really quite uh, quite interesting. So I encourage you to, uh, to access our materials, um, hopefully join as a member, uh, and then come out to our events when we go back uh, uh, real life, uh, in real life events again. Um, maybe uh, I could turn to a couple of uh, questions and I'll read some of them from the message box, but also I'd love it if some of you uh, want uh, to unmute and uh, maybe uh, in the message box, say you're interested in, uh, in asking a question and then uh, Joe can get a chance to uh, meet uh, some of you. Uh, but first, Joe, uh, Hubert asks, what about the transit systems we are building right now? The Ontario line, for example, we're planning lines like uh, there's no COVID or any aftermath. Uh, is this the right approach? Well, I think we're, we're building them. So uh, you'd have to be a brave man to say, stop building them. And, and, and clearly, I think we need to put the system in, particularly the Ontario line, the crucial line, uh, to get that in place. Uh, I, I, uh, don't misunderstand me. We're still going to need a hard wiring of transit lines. Uh, my worry is whether they will be used as much as we anticipated they were going to be used. Uh, which may not be such a terrible thing because the riding conditions under a lot of them were pretty bad, uh, certainly as we know on the, on the Young Street line. Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying stop, turn around uh, in terms of the physical uh, uh, projects that we've got uh, commitments to right now. They took so long to get, you'd be nuts to try and wind those up. Uh, what I am saying is that I think we need to think about what it is the product that we're offering and the service that we're offering uh, within the system that we've got. Uh, and a lot of the um, experimentation in terms of uh, a different kind of bus uh, delivery system uh, in, the, uh, in the suburbs, I think can be uh, done potentially without significant capital investment by um, by the public sector, if one's prepared to to consider the uh, the private transit franchise uh, idea. William Denning asked, "What is easier for a government to get correct? Either hiring marketing people and allowing consumer-driven transit services, or two, regulating the quality and pricing of a private service provider?" He wonders if it's true consumer-driven transit services, keeping in mind users are not identical to voters. Yeah, uh, I, I would like us to veer in terms of a system that is sensitive to the market. Uh, ultimately under public direction, must be under public direction, but a system that's got market feedback loops in it. Do we know whether uh, people would pick up on uh, off-peak fares? Uh, if we suddenly said, which is uh, a characteristic of the London transport system, you have a lower fare between uh, 10 o'clock and 3.30 um, than you do at the rush hour times. What would be the effect on ridership? We have no way of finding that out right now, uh, but it would be a very interesting thing to find out. And given that we are trying to spread the peak of people getting into all those high rise elevators downtown, uh, this mightn't be a bad idea. We had another consultant come present to us, I think two years ago, that said that uh, the UPX uh, uh, was uh, designed by an engineer, it was designed by 
a marketer uh, that uh, the stop would have been at Bay Street rather than past Simcoe, um, and that uh, that would have increased uh, um, ridership dramatically if a businessman uh, could have gone from Bay and King onto the uh, UPX rather than uh, having to walk the several extra blocks that it takes, uh, and said that he thought they just would grab a, an Uber or a taxi or a limo to the airport rather than walk to uh, past uh, University or York or Simcoe. Uh, and then second of all, you'd have uh, two stops at Pearson, one at uh, Terminal 1 and one at Terminal 3. Do you agree with those two comments? I, I think that's very sophisticated thinking. Uh, I agree. Uh, we, we all know, we've all wheeled our, our, uh, our bag uh, that endless walk, uh, by the way, where, where there are still not escalators um, from the subway to uh, the, the, the uh, UP Express, you still have to lug your bag upstairs. Uh, it, it, it's not designed for uh, the kind of fluidity uh, and uh, utter ease and comfort uh, that are part of the decision thinking of people about their life experiences now. Um, and uh, I, I keep it coming back to coffee. I mean, you can end up spending four or five bucks for a coffee. People are doing it. They got to be out of their heads. That's as much, uh, you know, two, two coffees and you paid for uh, uh, a, a UP Express fare. Um, and so I think we, we've got to have some price circuits in there. Um we got asked about face-to-face uh, -face meetings and uh, the importance of face-to-face -face meetings. And a lot of the things that you've talked about um, in regards to uh, um, you know, the death of downtown or not the death, but, but the diminution of downtown suggests that face-to-face -face meetings and Zoom is okay. What do you think? Are face-to-face -face meetings important or gonna come back? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I mean I, the other thing I said in the newspaper article is that, uh, I mean, uh, who on the call today hasn't had it with Zoom? You know, I mean, seriously. <laughs> You know, and the reason is because, uh, you know, I, I, I'm finding it hard to see your eyes. Uh, I can't interact with you. I can't say, oh, they didn't get that. I better make it better. Or, oh, my God, they think I'm talking nonsense. Um, there's a whole uh, uh, set of dimensions of face-to-face -face contact that are so much richer. The other thing is we're human beings. We like, a lot of us like work. We like meeting with people. Um, we love being at home, but we also love what we do, I, I hope. Uh, so uh, I, I, certainly in my, you know, we, we're working very hard in our firm, uh, about 80 people, uh, but I really worry about the uh, working conditions of a, a large part of, the, especially of the junior staff who, who don't know the senior staff very well, uh, you know, we brought on about 15 new people in the last, uh, in COVID. And I worry desperately, uh, you know, about the quality of their work life. So, uh, no, we human beings are social critters. And, and, and being social critters adds to the value and productivity of what we do. And so the, the, the office isn't over. The interesting thing on this one is that, you know, a, a lot of the tech guys were saying, ah, we're, we can, everybody can work remotely. Uh, well, uh, Facebook, Google, Microsoft uh, have all three and a few more have just made huge great pieces of office space in midtown Manhattan and in uh, central London. So uh, I, I think we should recognize, and, and they are very much the drivers of the modern city. William Denning, do you want to ask your question, sir? Um, to follow up on the one I, that you read just now? or I, I can't hear. Go for it. Alpha Bravo, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. just. Um, well, uh, Joe, I, I really do appreciate your point of view on a lot of this stuff, um, especially on the, um, the the concept that Toronto has to embrace being a big city. We are a big place, and we have a future as a big place, provided we can step up to it. Um, and I would also argue that Toronto has always done better when it has planned sort of two steps ahead of where it is now. In other words, in the early 1950s, when we were a town, we tended to think about what would it be to be a medium-sized city? And now that we're a medium-sized city, I think we should at least be thinking about what would it be to be a large city? Uh, that what you need is not so much, um, the, the, the mindset needs to be bigger than it is. And on the other side, on the service delivery side, I completely agree, I've had a lot of experience in private sector delivery of transport options. And that's 
you know, it, it can be done. What we don't have is a competence on the provincial and municipal government sides to, to actively engage and secure the public interest. Part of the problem there municipally is not having a municipality of the region of Toronto. Um, the one that currently bothers me the most is the Eglinton West um, Crosstown LRT extension um, because they're going through a unique, uh, very specialized, very accelerated procurement process to get us the tunnels built. Um, separately from that, later on, we'll get some procurement of vehicles and stations and signals and all the rest, but a very rapid procurement within the next month, really, of um, these tunnels. And the Metrolink's evaluation of this before COVID last February showed that this project costs about $5 billion and the economic impact is negative $3 billion. And politicians at the time said, well, we're not trying to make a profit. That confuses finance and economics. The economic impact is you will shrink the economy of Ontario by $3 billion. Why would we invest five to shrink the economy by three pre-COVID? Now, the analysis done now would, I suspect, be even worse. So well, I, how do we get out of this mindset? Yeah, I, I mean, the, 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 Bill, I, the, the, the real trouble is, I don't, I, I, I don't know. I, I mean, there, there are also some wicked problems that are irresolvable. You're never going to have a municipal government of the greater Toronto area because it would be three quarters of the province and no province in their right mind would ever allow such an entity to grow uh, uh, to that scale, I suspect. Uh, uh, and that's just a kind of uh, uh, at birth reality, which we who work here have to have to reckon with. Aline, do you want to ask the next question? Sure. Hi. Thank you. Hi, Eileen. How are you? I'm good. How are you? <laughs> How are you? It's so great to see you. And I see your uh, I see your sailing map behind you. So. <laughs> That's right. Thank you for thank you for staying on dry land to come and talk to us. Um, I, actually, this is a bit of a, a, a follow up to Bill's question because you know, Bill, I take your point, and I'm an economist, and I get the math of what you've just talked about. But where do we where do we address those non financial aspects of transit investments um, and that government should be considering? So, for example, all of those folks who are in precarious roles who are uh, don't have the choices, even if they even if the choices existed between the Starbucks transit ride and the and the Tim Hortons transit ride, there are many folks who can't make that choice, don't have the choice, the wherewithal to make the choice. But we need we need them to get to the job that we're asking them to do um, and also many of them are doing jobs that no many other people won't do um, so how do you reflect that in those business case calculations because i think that needs to be taken into account well one of the interesting things uh, that i find fascinating uh, a little bit the same way with air, the airplane business uh, the guys in the front of the plane pay for everybody in the back mm -hmm. Uh, the, the transit uh, ridership uh, premiums on the intercity rail uh, in England, which is basically anything over an hour or so, uh, you're paying three or four times as much for your, your seat uh, as the guys are who are on um, a premium price ticket. So uh, don't assume that a two-class system assumes that uh, the, 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 the less expensive ride uh, it is, uh, or, or assume that that less expensive ride is probably getting subsidized by the front of the bus. Uh, and uh, that's the kind of math which nobody has ever dreamt of doing. I don't know how, it's also tricky to know as a practical matter how you would do that on a, on a GO train or, or certainly on a TTC vehicle. Uh, but it is the kind of thing we need to think about. Uh, and you know, I, I would love it on the Lakeshore West and Lakeshore East line if we built a system, which I don't think is impossible to do, where you could go from Hamilton to Oakville uh, to Port Credit to Toronto, three, three stops, two stops. Uh, and you ought to be able to do that in about 45 minutes. You can't imagine the, the ridership you would get from that, because now it's a, a, a very laborious journey uh, and stopping every, uh, every 10 minutes. Uh, so that it's that kind of thinking that, um, and, and on that you could charge a lot of money for. 
You know, I got to tell you, I uh, am a frequent user of the Long Island Railway in Long Island. And yeah. uh, there is an express from Penn Station to uh, Southampton. Mm -hmm. Only runs on the weekends and only in the summer. Uh, but it's an express the whole way out. And you get a drink as you enter into the uh, the car, or at least drinks are available. Yeah. Uh, and it's packed crowded, so it's certainly not first class. But I got to tell you, it's packed crowded because it's very attractive to skip by probably 30 stations on the yeah. way to Southampton. Yep. Yeah. Nice Any other questions? Anyone else wanting to ask a question? The comment I had for Eileen was uh, transportation always has two dimensions. There's a side of it, which is um, a, a necessity. There's a minimum level of access and mobility that's a public good and should be available to everybody at some price. And that's a regulatory issue. Of where is that standard that we assume? It's like mm -hmm. um, elementary and secondary education, you don't pay separately to go to those schools. But then there's a huge proportion of transportation, which is commercially, um, could be in a commercial regime. And that's exactly what Joe's talking about. So once you set up your base standard, parliamentary trains of the 18, whatever it was, 1850s, um, above that standard, you should be applying commercial logic. Fair enough. And I think what Joe is also saying is that the network can, elements of the network and the product offering and the spectrum of um, different, different prices could be used to cross subsidize each other. So you don't have to worry about that uh, TTC transit ride because it actually is being paid for another product elsewhere in the system. Yeah. I mean, that's already happening. Yeah. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, the, the, uh, the Toronto Transit Commission, uh, not every bus route is equally profitable, mm -hmm. uh, but every bus route charges you the same fare. Uh, so, uh, you know, how you, th there are kinds of tricks that one could get into, I think, there in terms of, of differential pricing, distance pricing, uh, and, and, and other things. And again, one of the joys about the Presto card, I, I sincerely hope it's, it's not been the most encouraging piece of technology we've ever acquired. Uh, but I hope that it's capable of managing this kind of uh, imaginative uh, pricing. Joe, maybe I can ask you one last question. Um, what's your vision long-term if you were premier of Ontario or minister of transportation or the czar for transit in the GTA, what's the one big change in the next five years you'd love to put in place? Well, there are two related changes. Uh, first is I would love to see there being all transit being uh, the responsibility of one agency uh, and that there be one uh, uniform worn by every transit operator from St. Catharines uh, to, uh, to Oshawa. Uh, after then, and, and that, that agency would be responsible for all uh, for the Presto card, uh, for the receipt of all uh, fair revenues. Uh, and it would then, within very strong guidelines, uh, commission uh, no. individual parts of the system. I, I'm on to, a call. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, commission the individual parts of the system uh, to uh, operate in the most uh, efficient, effective way possible. Uh, and that would uh, sometimes involve private sector operators, sometimes not. Uh, but it's a little bit like with the, the garbage collection in Toronto. I love the idea of having uh, half the city privately collected, half the city publicly collected. Uh, we need to start doing that in, uh, in transit as well. Well, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for joining uh, us today on the Transit Alliance session. And uh, Joe Barrage, thank you so much for My uh, being Those our speaker be today. I really lots appreciate of, it. Lots of familiar faces. So nice to see. Thank you. And uh, maybe I could give one last pitch again. Uh, if you're at all interested, please uh, come to transitalliance.com and, uh, and join up as a member um, or at minimum uh, sign up for our newsletter so that you can get uh, all of our announcements of uh, future upcoming events. Uh, and this session has been recorded and we will be putting it on 9.60 a.m. Uh, probably in about two weeks uh, and or I'll be uh, posting it in Transit Alliance. I'll be posting it so you can listen to it again. And by the way, I've got this nightly radio show where I've interviewed a whole bunch of different people on transit and a whole bunch of other uh, topics. So feel free to um, take a look and you can see those on briancrombie.com. Joe Barrage, thank you so much. My pleasure.
Have a good evening. Thanks everyone for joining. Bye, Brian. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. It's interesting seeing all the people. Haven't seen you in a while, Brian. That was really great. Thanks, Saba. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm good. I missed you. It's been a long we, time. We got to get someone for uh, November. Any ideas? Yeah. Let me know. I'm in trial in November. I'm really, really swamped. <laughs> Things are going to ease up for me in mid-December. Okay. Well, let me know if you've got any uh, great ideas. Yeah, we will do. Okay. Thanks so much. Take good care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.